belong to the church is infinitely more significant than most people have ever realized. And when I say the church, I don't want you to think in terms of a building, but of a body of redeemed souls. When I say church, I don't want you to think in terms of a location, but of a living organism of ransomed sinners. When I say church, I don't want you to think geographically. I want you to think theologically about souls from every nation, handpicked by the Father and then given to the Son for whom he would die and purchased with his blood. That is the church. And you see, the thing about being a church is that at the end of the day, there are two great, profound realities that define and shape who we are. There's two great, profound realities that define and shape who we are. Because with all of the complexities that make the church what it is, with all the sophisticated moving parts that make the church what it is, there are two great realities that define who we are, and here they are. As a church, we have a mission, and as a church, we have a destination. That's it. Those are the two realities that should shape and govern everything that we are and everything that we do. We have a mission, and as a church, we have a destination. And you see, our destination is, of course, the kingdom. The sovereign, invincible kingdom of Jesus Christ in the future at the end of the age. That's the finish line of human history. That's where we're headed as a church. That is our destination. But you see, as a church, we also have a mission. And you see, if our destination is the kingdom, then our mission has to be to bring as many people with us into that kingdom as absolutely possible. Because at the end of the day, the people who will be there in the kingdom will be there precisely through the witness of the church. Those are the facts. And that urgent global mission of getting lost people into the kingdom is exactly what we see in our text this morning. Because you know where we are is the Psalms. And in particular, a mission psalm, a kingdom psalm, a psalm in which the poet pleads with God not only to bring his plan to completion, but also that even he and his people would be used by God to help complete that plan. Why? Because the psalmist knew. The psalmist, he understood the logical implications of having Yahweh as his God. He understood that to have salvation automatically means that you be used by God to help bring that salvation to the ends of the earth. He understood that authentic faith is not to have our private little party while the world burns out there, but precisely to run into the fire and snatch people. And you know, the reason why we're talking about this is because we're in the middle of a series on missions and the Great Commission called Impossible and Invincible. And the reason why it's called that is because it's both of those things at the exact same time. It is impossible for us as fallen, fragile, fallible people. But for the one who is sovereign and supreme and who has all authority in heaven and on earth, it is invincible. This is certain. This is guaranteed. This is going to happen. Why? Because the invincible purpose of God is that the gospel spread to all the peoples of the world and take root in God-centered, Christ-exalting churches. And I believe that by God's grace, we can be that kind of church. That if we play our cards right, that we don't ever have to be a church that lives in the glory days of how things used to be. That 
we can push on to new horizons and vistas for the Great Commission. Are you with me? Because how we be that kind of church is by opening the text, opening the sacred text and letting the global heart of God grip us with a gospel that saves of grace that transforms, and of a really sovereign God who's going to win it all in the end. And so I want to point you again to Psalm 67. Let's go to the text. And let's let the global heart of God grip you with the poet's passion to see the plan of God come to completion and how we can be a part. Maybe you have the notes for this morning's message. Maybe you don't. Either way, here's where we're going. This morning, I want you to see from our text three passionate pleas. Three passionate pleas you must pray while we wait for the global joy of the kingdom of God. That's where we're going. Three passionate pleas you must pray while we wait for the global joy of the kingdom of God. And so passionate plea number one, you must plead for God's power to proclaim God's name. You must plead for God's power to proclaim God's name. Because this is surprising, isn't it? That the passion to preach and the zeal to reach lost people is actually found in the Old Testament? That feels surprising to, to us because we tend to think that the people of Israel only cared about the people of Israel, but it shouldn't be. This shouldn't be surprising. Because from the beginning, God had revealed a global plan to undo what Adam had done. To reverse the curse and take back the rebel planet and fill it with worshipers from every tribe and tongue and nation and people. That is the plan. That's always been the plan. And that's precisely what the poet prays for in Psalm 67. And yet I want you to notice how he prays because what this is, is poetry. This is poetry. Carefully crafted, highly structured Hebrew poetry and the thing about it Hebrew poetry is that it's nothing at all like English poetry. In English poetry, we like rhyming and timing and rhythm and tempo, which is Hebrew poetry loves structure and shape. See, Hebrews love to organize their poems in such a way to draw our attention to particular theological themes. In fact, what this poem here is called is a chiasm. It's a chiasm. And all that means is that it is a poetic whirlpool that draws our attention to the middle. And you see how a chiasm works is that the first and the last verse are parallel. The second and next to last verse are parallel. And on and on it goes until you get to the middle, which is the culminating gravitational center of the whole psalm. And everything in, in that psalm points to and complements the middle. And you can see it in the text, and in your notes, if you have the notes, I have, a, I have organized the text in such a way for you to see it. But notice, notice, verses 1 and 2 and 6 and 7, parallel. Asking for God's power to proclaim God's name. But then notice, verses 3 and 5, parallel. They're exactly the same. Look at the text. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Verse 5, let the peoples praise you, let all the peoples praise you. They are identical, and that is not accidental. Those duplicate verses perfectly frame the center of the psalm in verse 4, which unfolds for us the finish line of human history and what the end of the world is going to be. So I'm just going to preach the chiasm. Start at the outer rings, work our way to the middle in the hopes that we will evermore absorb the global vision of the psalmist to see salvation reach to the ends of the earth. The urgent please begin in verse 1. Look at the text. He says, let God be gracious to us and let him bless us. Let him cause his face to shine upon us. <laughs> Selah. And you notice the three things for which he asks. 
God's grace, God's blessing, and God's faith to shine. And those are big. Those are really big. And we're going to see what they mean. But I do not want you to overlook the first word and the most important word in the psalm and in the whole book of psalms and in the entire Bible and in the universe, namely the first word. That's not, an incident. That's not a little detail. That means absolutely everything. Because God means absolutely everything. And you see, the poet knows that this God exists to be loved, and treasured, and worshipped, and adored. And yet, because that does not happen, because he is largely ignored, and belittled, and blasphemed in the world, is because... It is exactly why this psalm exists. It's because billions and billions of people in the world do not know him. And so the poet pleads for God, for his grace, for his, his, his grace and his blessing and his face to shine upon them. The question is, why? Why does he want that? What do those things mean? And why does he want them? To in, improve his personal quality of life? To build bigger barns, to increase his comforts and securities, live in ease and luxury. No, none of those things. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. Rather, mission is the answer. Look at verse 2. Bless us, cause your face to shine upon us. Why? That your way would be known on the earth, your salvation among all. All of a sudden, it's really clear what he's asking for in verse 1, isn't it? Not the mushy comforts of a pain-free life, but for everything that they need to finish the mission. That the ends of the earth would know and love the living God. And what they need for that is grace and blessing and God's face to shine. Meaning what? I mean, what, what is he asking for? tell you what he's asking for. He is pleading for, in order, God's power, God's provision, and the pleasure of God. You see, grace is power, blessing is provision, and God's face shining upon you is the sovereign gift of pleasure in himself. That's what he's talking about. I mean, don't you see, if we're going to proclaim God's name, and if we're going to spread his fame to the nations and to our neighbors, we need God to bless us. Because grace is the power of God to do what God requires. And secondly, if salvation is really going to reach to the ends of the earth, and to the co-workers that we see every single day, we desperately need God to bless us, which is not the enjoyment of our private little pleasures while the world burns out there, but rather it is the generous provision of everything we need to finish the mission. You have to understand, to be blessed by God has nothing to do with the private enjoyment of our little personal luxuries. Rather, it is God freeing us from everything that would otherwise prevent us from living for the cause. And finally, if we're really going to have the guts we need to be sheep in the midst of wolves and lambs in the lion's den, we need God to show us his face. And all that is is a metaphor a metaphor to describe the unhindered pleasure in God himself. Because you see, when we see God, I mean really see him for the treasure that he is, let's put it this way, unless we are exhilarated by God, we will always be hindered in our passion to preach to lost people. And the psalmist understood that. So this... This just changes everything, doesn't it? The, the way we pray and how we think about our lives, why we pray and how we live our lives, 
I mean, think about it. Everything in this guy's life was prioritized around the global cause of Yahweh. Everything he wanted, everything he prayed for, was always for the sake of the nations. Which means he understood that faith in Yahweh automatically meant the proclamation of that faith. That to be a people chosen by God automatically makes you a people sent by God to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Are you hearing this this morning? And what this means is we've had it all wrong for so long in America. We want grace. And we want blessing, and we want God's face to shine upon us, and we should want those things, and yet we forget. We don't even know what those things are for. God never gives us those things as a means to escape the world, but precisely as a means to engage the world. That all the ends of the earth would know it. Because look again, look again at verse 2. Why does he ask for what he does? God, we need these things. We really, really need these things. Verse 2, that your way would be known on the earth, your salvation among all of the nations. And there it is, isn't it? The happy ever after of God's plan. The finish line of all human history, namely, when God's ways are known on the earth and his salvation among all of the nations. That's exactly where human history is headed, and he knows it. And not only does he know that's going to happen, he is asking for the power of God to help make that happen. Because he does not want to be a spectator of what God is doing in the world. He wants to be a participator of what God is doing in the world. He wants to be where the action is. Well, the bullets are flying in the trenches on the front lines. Why? Because he knows. He gets it. God not only ordains the end to his plan, but the means to his end. Listen carefully now. We are People who will be there in the kingdom will be there through the witness of the church. And notice, notice in the text, notice what it is he envisions. Notice what he knows is definitely going to happen at the end of the age. He says that the way of God will be known on the earth. Meaning what? Meaning, get this now, one day there will be a new world order. The current wicked world system that exists today, he's going to blow it up and establish his sovereign rule and authority over all of the earth. One day the world will be filled with the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. One day at the end of the age, when all history is over, the ways of God will be known and loved and treasured. And finally, we will be able to say the will of God is done on earth exactly as it's done in heaven. We cannot say that yet, but we will. We will say that. And yet the question is, when is that supposed to happen? Is that going to happen? Mark my words, that is going to happen. When? in the future kingdom of Jesus Christ, at the second coming when he takes back the rebel planet and establishes his invincible sovereign empire on it. In other words, what this is, is the very restoration of paradise itself. This is what the entire Old Testament is looking forward to. It's what he is looking forward to. Psalm 72 says that when the Messianic king comes, when the Davidic king comes to reign, that he will rule from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. And so what he's pleading, understand this, what he's pleading for is that he and his people could be a part of that. To help people get into the kingdom because he knows, he knows the people who will be there in the kingdom will be there through the witness of his people. I don't 
get there on their own. They get there through means, through preaching, through pleading, through praying, through church planting, all the while suffering persecution. That is what that is. That is the means. The question is, do you know that? Did you know that you and I, that this church, that we are the means? That we are a church with a mission headed towards a destination. Our destination is the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and our mission is to populate that kingdom with as many people as absolutely possible. That is what he's after. That is what he wants. Is that what you want? But notice the second half of the verse. God gives us grace and blessing in his favor. Why? The psalmist says, so that your salvation would be among all of the nations. What does he see? What, what does he envision happening in the future? What he sees is salvation in every tribe and tongue and nation and people. And funny thing about that word, salvation, more than mere forgiveness. It's so much more three-dimensional than, than mere freedom from judgment and guilt. No, salvation in the minds of the Jews, get this, was something cosmic and comprehensive. It was something sweeping and eschatological. In other words, salvation was not only forgiveness and eternal life of the individual. It was the cosmic redemption of creation itself. The prophets reveal that when the Messiah returns and brings his kingdom with him, he will reverse the curse. He will lift the spell, and he will restore the paradise which once was lost at the beginning. Because you know, some people, don't they? They love to flip houses for a living. Other people love to refurbish old cars and make them new. Hollywood loves to do movies. We have a savior. When he comes, he will flip the whole planet when he arrives. He will refurbish the earth and make it new. He will spiritually remaster the earth and everything in it. He's going to make all things be the way they ought to be. You understand, this is what Jesus paid for. This is what he bought with his blood. Not only the redemption of the individual, but the redemption of creation itself. And all the poet is asking is that he and his people would be a missionary people to get pagan nations saved and into that kingdom. My question is, do you own this? Do you own this? Do you share the conviction with the psalmist that the only people who will be saved at the end of the age will be saved through the witness of the church? That we are the means. That the church is is the channel through which salvation will reach to the ends of the earth. And if you think about it, this applies to us at a really practical level, doesn't it? If we don't speak, they don't get saved. If we don't preach, they will most certainly perish. And so how we participate in what God is doing in the world is to have real conversations with real people, preaching to them and pleading with them and praying for them and, and persuading them that Jesus Christ is the answer to absolutely everything. My question is, are you willing to have those conversations? Not just mention in passing that you go to church somewhere, 
But are you willing to insert yourself into the lives of real unbelievers and invite both the pleasure and the persecution that's going to come? We have a mission. We have a destination. We see it again in verses 6 and 7. Remember, this is a chiasm. Look at the text, the outer ring of the circle. Verse, it's parallel to verses 1 and 2. He prays the exact same thing as he does in verses 1 and 2. He says, let the earth give its produce. Let God, our God, bless us. Let God bless us. Why? So that ends, so that all the ends of the earth may fear him. Now I know that your Bible says it different than that. But I believe that the Hebrew grammar indicates that he's not merely stating something, he is asking. It's parallel with verses 1 and 2. He's asking. He's asking for the earth to yield its produce. He is asking for God to bless them. Meaning what? What does it mean to ask that the earth would yield its produce? What does that mean? Well, think about it. The Jews were an agricultural people, right? They lived off the land, didn't they? They survived. They made their living through what God provided from the land. And so all he's asking for here, get this, is the blessing and provision of God. Not to indulge their private, selfish appetites, but why? What reason did he give? Look again at verse 7. Let our God bless us. Why? Why? So that all the ends of the earth would fear him. That is unbelievable, isn't it? What a radical paradigm shift that is from our entitled American mentalities. We are so addicted and infatuated with our private pleasures and securities. But please think about it. He wanted the blessing of God just like we do. He wanted to earn a good living just like we do. Put it this way. He wanted to make as much income as absolutely possible or as much as God was willing to provide. Why? To increase his standard of living? No. To increase his standard of giving. Let God bless us so that all the ends of the earth would fear him. I said this to the finance class over and over again last semester. We are increasingly and rightly concerned about being debt-free in America. That's good, and that's right, and we should pursue that. But you see, as slaves of Christ, and as heirs of his global kingdom, our calling is so much higher than merely being debt-free. The goal is not debt-free. The goal is generosity for the Great Commission. I don't want your money. But I do want you to see that everything you own is the currency for the global cause of Jesus Christ. So I'm just going to punch you in the wallet right now. How are you doing with money, finances, possessions, and the provision of God? How are you doing with those things? Because you have every right to ask for those things. You do. And your father knows that you need them. And he is even willing to grant them to you. But what I'm asking is, do you share the perspective of the poet and that you know that everything you own is on loan for the sacred mission of reaching the world? Because one day the earth will fear Yahweh. And it will tremble before him as the treasure of their souls. 
and a sacred global kingdom coming to a planet near you. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, but the people who will be there in that kingdom will be there only through the proclamation and witness and means of the church. We are the means. Which brings us to passionate plea number two. Passionate plea number two, you must plead for the peoples to sing God's praise. You must plead for the peoples to sing God's praise. And now we get to the next ring inside the circle. The poet just pled for the power of God to proclaim God's name, did he not? It is pled for the power that was required, the blessing of God that was required to, to help bring salvation to the ends of the earth. But here you see in verses 3 and 5, get this, he explains exactly what it's going to be like when that happens. In other words, what's it going to be like when God's kingdom comes to earth? What's it going to be like? Well, what's going to happen when that's there? What, what's what is it going to be like when all of God's elect are saved and every tribe and nation has salvation? What's it going to be like? I'll tell you what it's going to be like. Psalm 67, verses 3 and 5. Look at the text. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Verse 5. Let the peoples praise you, O oh God. Let all the peoples praise you. That is what it is going to be like. This is the destination. Global praise from all the peoples on the planet. Do you see the connection? Do you see what he's doing with the chiasm? And the fact that it's repeated twice is his way of saying this is definitely going to happen. And it's going to be incredible. And there are three features, three features of this global kingdom portrayed in verses three. Three features of this global kingdom described in those verses. Number one, notice, there will be praise. There will be praise in the future global kingdom, which is obvious, right? Because four times in two verses, the psalmist pleads for the peoples of the earth to praise, praise, praise. Praise, and that's exactly what's going to happen when the king comes to reign. Mm -hmm. And what this does is raise the question, doesn't it? Because we talk about praising God all the time, and we should talk about that. But what does that mean to praise God? It means, very simply, to prize God for the supremely valuable treasure that he is. Praise is but the expression of what it is that we prize the most. We declare the worth of what it is that delights us. We sing the worth of what satisfies our souls. And so what the psalmist is picturing is this uncontainable, thunderous delight from all the nations when God tears through the stratosphere and establishes his sovereign kingdom on this planet. There will be Praise. Which raises the question, doesn't it? Do you praise God? And by that I mean, do you prize God for the supremely valuable treasure that he is? Or do you use God as a means to get what you really Because you see it, don't you? The implications of our praise now and the implications that that has on the Great Commission, that our praise, our worship now has really profound implications for the global mission of Jesus Christ. There are two implications that our worship now has for the Great Commission. Here they are. Worship, and this is in your notes, so if you're following along, you can see it. Worship and not missions is the most important activity in the church. Does that feel shocking to you to hear that? Worship and not missions is the most important activity in the church. What I mean is, 
Global praise is the goal of history. Agreed? That's where history is headed. And what that means is that missions is a means to a greater, more satisfying end. Missions is a temporary necessity. But when this age is over and the countless millions of redeemed fall on their face before God, missions will be no more, but worship abides forever. And the, implica and the second implication that our praise now has on the Great Commission, number two, worship is the fuel and goal of missions. Worship is the fuel of and it is the goal of missions. What I mean is, global praise is the goal of history. Agreed? But prizing God now is what gives us the power to preach. Don't you see? Where passion for God is weak, Zeal for missions will be weak. But when the flames of worship burn in the soul, the light of missions will shine to the darkest places on the earth. Therefore, the secret to being used by Christ to cause ripple effects for eternity is to each day open the sacred text and climb the Himalayan heights of the pages of Scripture to see the glory of who God is, because when you see Him, then you will worship Him, and worship is the fuel and goal of missions. But notice, there's a second feature of what this future kingdom is going to be like. The first aspect was that there will be praise there. The second feature of what will be there in this future kingdom is that there will be people there. And in particular, notice what verses 3 and 5 says, there will be peoples there. Plural. Look at the text. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Think about that. Peoples, tribes, Nations, ethno-linguistic people groups from every corner of the earth one day will live in satisfied submission to the living God. And think about what, he, this, this, think about what he's picturing. Egyptians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Arabians, Greeks, and Ethiopians, people who in that day hated Yahweh. And one day they will live in joyful submission to the king. And we know that he means nations not just limited to his own vicinity that he could get there through a walk or through a boat ride. He meant nations scattered all over the planet that he could not, not even imagine because he says all of the peoples. You understand he's picturing something global. You understand, he's picturing something sweeping and comprehensive where one day God will be treasured by every nation on the planet. And, and what's interesting to me is that the world out there, the unbelieving, unsaved, secular world, they kind of get this. What I mean is that they, they feel it in their bones that the world should unite in, in global celebration for something what that's supposed to be. I mean, recently, providentially, it just so happened, I don't know how I found it, but I came across this really cheesy, ridiculous Coca-Cola commercial from the 70s. And it's this, it's this commercial where like a couple hundred different people from all over the world, they get together on this mountain somewhere, and they all have Cokes in their hand, and they sing this really ridiculous song called, I'd Like to Buy the World with Coke. <laughs> And everyone's holding hands and drinking Cokes together, and stupid though the commercial was, it made me realize the world, I kind of get it. They suspect that it would be really, really great if 
there was just something out there that could unite every tribe and tongue and nation and people, that the ideal situation to which we should strive is a kind of glorious harmony between the nations filled with joy, and yet the best they could do to come up with to do that was a soft drink that gives you cavities and diabetes. <laughs> See, the best the world can do is a tasteless, shapeless, godless, convictionless utopia where everyone just kind of lives in some kind of dream world. This will not do, says the poet. Because to unify the world, you need an object big enough. You need an object glorious enough that everyone in the world can agree this thing is so glorious and beautiful that it is worth unifying over. You need something, or should I say, you need someone whose majesty has the gravitational power to unify an entire planet filled with chaos. And the only thing that fits that description is Yahweh in all of his unfiltered majesty and glory, which brings us to the third feature of the future, namely God himself will be there, reigning on the earth. Look at verses 3, 4, 5. Your choice. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let the peoples praise you. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Do you see that? If you count the pronoun you, God is addressed six times in two verses. In this inner ring of the chiasm, the psalmist is working really, really hard to put God on display as the all-satisfying object of the, as the nation's delight. Because Why? Because he has zero interest in some man-centered utopia. He's not merely interested in world peace. What he cares about, the only thing that really matters in the end, savored in the soul as supreme. Because worship is ultimate, not missions. Because God is ultimate, not man. And I believe that when all is said and done, at the end of the day, get this now, the God whom the nations will worship will be the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Messiah, which means Psalm 67 is, in its own way, prophetic. It is, in its own way, eschatological. It is predictive of how things are going to be, and Christ himself said this very thing in Matthew 25. It's in your notes. He says, whenever the Son of Man should come in his glory, and all of his angels with him, then he shall sit on his what? His glorious throne. And all the who nations will be gathered before him. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation. So my question is, what do we do with the global praise portrayed here in verses 3 and 5? Does this have anything to do with us? It has everything to do with us. Two reasons. Two reasons why this global praise pictured in verses 3 and 5 has everything to do with us now. Number one, the people who will be there in the future praising the Messiah will be there precisely through the witness of the church. Through you. Through us. There's not another way. We are the means. This is what Christ meant when he said to make disciples of all the nations. Psalm 67 is but the finish line of the mission that Christ has given to the church. The kingdom is the destination. Populating the kingdom is our mission. And so my question for you is, who are they? Who are they? Who are the people? 
that God has providentially placed in your life that need to hear the gospel? What are their names? What do they look like? What are they like? Because, do you see? They are a person created in the image of God under the wrath and judgment of God, who need the grace of God, found alone in the Son of God. And just think about, think about what it is that you have to offer the lost people in your lives. Think about what, the, the message that you are called to proclaim. Infinite joy and a sovereign kingdom on a renewed planet, under the reign of a matchless king. That is your message. That is literally the most unembarrassing message in the universe. May God give you strength to proclaim that. Number two. Number two. Second implication of this global kingdom in the future, there is tons of confusion out there as to what the mission of the church actually is. Lots and lots of confusion. <coughs> And while feeding the poor, the sex trade, social justice, abortion ministry, and or orphan ministry, and abortion have their rightful place, hear me what I'm saying, they have their rightful place in the concern of the church, those are not the mission of the church. I'm not saying don't do those things. I'm just saying those are not the mission given to the church, is it? It's make disciples of all nations. Because what we want is not merely the betterment of mankind, but the supremacy of God, savored by every tribe and nation. What that means is, what that means is, what should provoke the most compassion, the most compassion in our souls is that humanity, by and large, doesn't know the living God. But you see, the centrality of God in our destination dictates that he must be central also in our mission. In other words, the gospel is the thing. <laughs> Which brings us to passionate plea number three. Very quickly, passionate plea number three. And yes, I will finish on time. You don't believe me. I will. Passionate plea number three, you must plead for the nations to love God's reign. You must plead for the nations to love God's reign, because that's the question. That's the question. What is it called when you have something on the top and the bottom, and you have something tasty and delicious in the, in the middle? What is that called? Well, there's some things to choose from. There are Oreos. There are ice cream sandwiches. There are calzones, there are Philly cheesesteak sandwiches, there are double-double In-N-Out burgers, of which I had several this last week. <laughs> All of those things qualify, the main point of which is to get the thing in the middle. The answer of the psalmist, however, what is it when you have something on the top and bottom and something tasty and delicious in the middle? The answer is Psalm 67, verse now we get to the culminating center and core and entree of the song. Now we get to the gravitational center that everything else in the poem has been looking forward to. And here's the thing about verse 4 that you have to understand. What this is, what we find here in verse 4, is what the poet most wants to see happen. And it is the clearest explanation of why it is the nations will praise. Look at the text, verse 4. Here is the destination. He says, let the nations be glad and literally let them shout for joy. Why? For you, God, will judge the peoples with uprightness and you will guide the nations on the earth. Selah. And you hear it, don't you? volcanic, joyful exuberance for which he prays for the nations. And notice the intensity of those terms. Let them, let them be glad. Let them shout for joy. Put the pieces together. Verses 3 and 5, there is praise. And here there is gladness and shouting for joy. One day, the screams of anger and the cries of agonies that fill the planet will be replaced by gladness and shouting. 
Mark my words, this is the destination. This is where all of human history is headed. And the question is why? When is this going to happen? How is this going to happen? When will there be gladness and shouting for joy? Notice the grammar in the text. Look at verse 4. Let the nations be glad and let them shout for joy. Why? Why would they do that? For you, God, will judge. It's future tense in the Hebrew. You will judge the earth. You will judge the peoples with uprightness. You will guide the nations on the earth. This is future. This is a kingdom. The two reasons why the nations will be glad and shout for joy is because, number one, God will judge the peoples with uprightness. And the thing of it is, that word judge, that just doesn't do that word justice. That word judge literally has the idea of bringing order out of chaos. It literally is, is to take something backwards and twist it and chaotic and perverted like our entire planet, by the way, and bring it to a place of complete order and equilibrium. It's a new world order. What we're talking about is complete, is a complete political, economic, social, and spiritual overhaul when Jesus Christ establishes his sovereign kingdom on the planet. And notice that he will do so with uprightness meaning no corruption, no scandals, no underhanded maneuvering, no bribes, no deception, no manipulation, no political lobbying or power grabbing. Rather, when Jesus Christ comes, he will literally extract the power of sin, the curse of sin from the planet, and reestablish his sovereign rule and authority on it. And the result of that will be such euphoria, such euphoria over the kingdom utopia that the nations will be glad and shout for joy. The second reason why the nations will be glad and shout for joy is because God will guide the nations on the earth. God will guide the nations on the earth. And, and don't misunderstand, God is sovereign right now. He rules all things today. Nothing happens apart from the sovereign decree of God, including sin and evil. But one day, one day, in the person of his Son, God will bring all things into conformity to the glory of his word. His will will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Because that song, this world is not my home, you remember that song? It's kind of a misnomer. This world will be your home. It will be. When Jesus Christ comes to reign, it will be your home. The song should say instead, this world, in its current state and condition, is not my home, but it will be my home. And King Jesus comes to rule and reign and restore the paradise which once was lost. Doesn't quite roll off the tongue as well, but that is what the song should say. And so think about what the psalm means for us today. A couple of implications, and then I'm done. Number one. Number one, this psalm makes really clear that God's goal in history, God's goal for the Great Commission, is not merely his glory, but the gladness of the nations in his glory. The global joy of the nations is the mission of the church. The global joy of the nations is the mission of the church. And the nations who will be there rejoicing in the kingdom will be there precisely through the means and instrument of the church. Through you, through us, through this church. We are brokers of eternal joy through the proclamation of the gospel. Last implication number three. I want some of you to leave. Not to other churches, but to other nations to plant other churches. I want you to pray about leaving the comfy confines of America. And let us as a church send you behind enemy lines into the darkness 
to stand with your toes on eternity and plead with ruined sinners to be saved. I'm asking you to pray about becoming a missionary, in other words. And those of you who don't go, those of you who stay, those of you who send those who go, for you, nothing changes. Your job is the exact same as theirs. Make disciples of all of the nations. The difference is they need a passport to do what they're doing. Your job, exactly the same. close with this. I want this church to be a haven. A haven preparing vessels. Not for the cushy yacht life of American luxury. But I want this to be a church preparing battleships armed with the gospel who venture into the storm-tossed, shark-infested ocean of humanity, because as a church, we have a mission, and we have a destination, and that mission cannot possibly fail. And believe me when I say that that destination most certainly will not disappear. We ask, oh God, for you to be gracious to us, and for you to bless us, and for you to cause your face to shine upon us, because now we see so differently what that means, Lord. That is to arm us and equip us and empower us for a sacred mission, which Christ, when we placed our faith in you, that is the mission to which we were recruited. That what it means to be a disciple, oh Christ, is not just that we, that we have a transform life, that we turn over a new leaf, but that we are called to save and pluck people from the flames. Give us grace, Christ. Give us grace. Give us such supreme joy in you that disciple-making would be natural for us, that this would be obvious for us, that we would in no way commit the crime of thinking that making disciples is something extra added to the Christian life, that this is the Christian life, that this is inherent in what we do. This is what it means to belong to you. Not only that we believe in you, but that we are brokers of eternal joy through the proclamation of the gospel. Make us, I pray, a global outpost of joy in a world of despair. for the supreme glory of the Son. things for you as we move on. Um, the first thing is, uh, those of you, especially uh, for you at home, this will be good news for you. Uh, this is the last Sunday that you'll have to put up with fuzzy, grainy, pixelated, hard to hear services from Christ Community Bible Church. Next Sunday, we go live with brand new technology. It will look uh, uh, beautiful and clear. I mean, so clear you'll be able to see my pores. You'll be able to see if I actually shaved this morning or not. It'll be that clear. Uh, no, we, but we, we, we are doing this because we want to serve you at home, and, and we just want to make this a, a, a way to make a, a wider, broader impact. Uh, and so that's happening next week. Just wanted you to know that. Uh, we're actually flying in a specialist, a friend of mine who's going to come here and helps everything up. He's going to be here on Sunday morning with us and train people how to run it. And uh, I'm, I'm excited for that. So that's a great, that's a great step forward for us. The second announcement is uh, we have books of the month. We really want to equip people and train people to uh, to think rightly, to think theologically, and. Um, the uh, books for this month, they all relate to the church. First one is the rule of love. If you want to learn how to help create a loving church, because that's up to you. It doesn't happen without you. You have to help make it that way. Uh, that's what the rule of love is all about. What does it mean to be a loving church? What does it mean to be a loving church owner? So a great book. You, you will love it. The second one relates directly with what we're talking about in this series, Let the Nations Be Glad. Uh, my favorite book on missions, just so stirring and gripping and helpful. It's not, a, it, it's not an easy read, but, but the things that are best for us in life rarely are easy. So please get one of those two books and be changed by them. And just by reading them, you'll help strengthen the health of this church. Finally, uh, the last one is um, 
Uh, we are going to do a, you know, at once a month we do a prayer summit. Uh, we just get together and pray on the first uh, Sunday of each month. We do that via Zoom. Um, and we're going to turn this uh, into both family, uh, a family meeting and a prayer summit. So I think it's just time that we have a family meeting together, just give you updates about where we're going as a church, let you ask questions. This, this season has been really hard to communicate, right? We see each other kind of in passing, and, and it's hard to feel connected. So I, I want this to be a time not only where we share, or I share where the elders are going in the near future, but also for you to have a time where you can ask questions about different things that are happening in the church. And, um, you know, not that we're experts at this, but, you know, if communication is love, we want to communicate a whole bunch, and we want you to be able to have a platform to be able to communicate with us as leaders, too. So that will be September 6th, uh, 2020. I know that that's a, a holiday weekend, but just, just get back in time, and then join us for that. Um, and so that'll be, um, that'll be uh, good for us as a church, okay? All right, why don't you stand, and let's close with a benediction. Take it from Psalm 67. May the God who gives grace, may the God who blesses, may the God who causes his face to shine upon us, may he give us the grace, power, the blessing, and the provision to make his way known on the earth, his salvation among all of the nations. You're dismissed. We'll see you next week. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, 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 oh